Welcome everyone to our 13th annual World Veg Fest and our first time hosting the International Vegetarian Union. Dr. Greger is a graduate of the Cornell University School of Agriculture and the Tufts University School of Medicine. He became vegan in 1990. He's currently the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. His books include Bird Flu, A Virus of Our Own Hatching, and Carbophobia, The Scary Truth Behind America's Low Carb Craze. He appeared as an expert witness to testify about mad cow disease when cattle producers sued Oprah Winfrey for libel. Dr. Greger's nutrition work can be found at nutritionfacts.org, which is now a nonprofit charity. All his speaking fees and proceeds goes from the sale of his books and DVDs are all donated to charity. Please welcome Dr. Michael Greger. Good afternoon. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, Every year, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. <laughs> every year, the presentation is brand new because every year, the science is brand new. Now, normally, this uh, presentation is based off my uh, latest uh, uh, nutrition DVD in 2007. If you remember, I presented my volume one, then 2008, 2009, 2010. Get closer to the mic. Hello? Uh, it, do, it doesn't raise. Up for, oh. Right. There we go. It's called the. That's the. All right. All right. We'll do that. All right, and then last year, um, I uh, presented my uh, volume five. Since la last summer, though, I've come out with six, seven, eight, nine, ten, actually 11 launches next week, and I actually have a few copies here, though, um, if folks are interested. So this is, what, the 12 new hours of new material. Why? Because of a promise I made last year. I said I was going to start a website. And on that website, I said I'm going to put everything I've ever done on it for free, so you could share and search, discuss, ask questions, done. And I said I was uh, going to list all the sources, so you could actually um, click on it, um, and, and click and read the actual papers yourself, make up your own mind, done. Then I got a little bold and promised that I would upload a new video every day. And every day since I've uploaded a new video, I used to have to wait, you know, till next San Francisco Veg Fest to see my new material. Now you just have to wait until the next morning. <laughs> NutritionFacts.org has taken over my life. <laughs> Was it worth it? Is it the number of views on the site? One million, two million, three million in the first year. I reached more people with this life-changing, life-saving information in one day than I used to traveling around the country all year. Uh, the, so the first and only free, non-commercial, science-based website to provide free daily updates on the latest discoveries in nutrition. I hope uh, people will sign up, check it out. All right. This afternoon, what I'd like to do is offer some highlights from this last year, from these last six DVDs, and offer um, kind of sneak previews from some new stuff. Um, let us begin. In past years, I've covered the most pressing dietary issues of our time. Like, what's the healthiest variety of apple? Right? Uh, well, let's, you know, what's the, the most nutritious nut? And so apple was Ida Red, and this is pecans. Or what's the best dried fruit? It's actually dried pomegranate seeds. 
uh, what's the best bean, the best berry, the best bowel movement. I remember seeing this there. <laughs> we had fun, right? We, people won some prizes. A couple people came away all huffy, especially the New Yorkers, if you remember. That was three ounces a day that, if they would just eat a Big Apple once in a while. <laughs> um, but this year I thought I'd lighten it up a little bit and answer, what's the best way to prevent death? Every year the CDC updates the 15 leading causes of death in the United States. So let's just start at number one, go down through the list, see what's new in each category. Heart disease, number one killer of both men and women in this country. The 35 year follow up of the Harvard Nurses Health Study was just published. Um, uh, which uh, is now the most definitive long-term study ever done on older women's health. Uh, since the study started, uh, thousands of participants have died, but that allows us to um, understand the risk factors for mortality. Because heart disease was the leading cause of death, no surprise that dietary cholesterol intake was a significant risk factor for early death. And the second leading cause was smoking-related cancer deaths. And the reason I wanted to show you this study is because it's a really neat study because it's called a competing risks analysis that actually lets you compare risks to one another. And it turns out that consuming the amount of cholesterol one finds in a single egg appears to cut a woman's life short as much as smoking five cigarettes a day for 15 years. And this is a finding that was supported last month by this crack team of Canadian researchers who found the same kind of exponential increase in the amount of, uh, um, of plaque clogging their arteries in both smokers and egg eaters. The most protective behavior was found to be fiber consumption. Eating just a cup of oatmeal worth of fiber a day appeared to extend a woman's life as much as four hours of weekly jogging. Though there's no reason you can't do both. <clears throat> But it's worth noting that, look, the intake of cholesterol only found in animal foods was associated with living a shorter life, and the intake of fiber only found in plant foods was associated with living a longer life. The one specific food actually most tied to longevity was actually nuts. It appears eating two servings of nuts a week also gets you that kind of four hours of jogging um, extension to one's life. Yeah, heart disease, number one cause of death. But what if your cholesterol is normal? I hear that all the time. New patients come to me. Oh, my cholesterol is normal. Well, I have to break it to them that, look, having a normal cholesterol in a society where it's normal to drop dead of a heart attack, <laughs> uh, not necessarily a good thing. It's our number one killer. So in this huge study last year, um, most heart attack patients fell within the recommended targets for cholesterol, showing that uh, the current guidelines are just not low enough to cut heart disease risk enough. Right? Close to half of heart attack victims, these are people in the hospital with a heart attack, half had, um, had uh, bad cholesterol levels classified by the guidelines as optimal though I'm not sure their grieving spouses and orphan children would take much comfort in that fact. Right? What's considered optimal is still way too high. Yeah, having a below average cholesterol can lower your risk, but as the editor-in-chief of the American College of Cardiology wrote more than a decade ago, it's time to start shifting from just decreasing risk to actually preventing and stopping atherosclerosis altogether. How do you do that? Right? We don't want low risk. We want no risk. This is how it's done. For the progression of uh, plaque in our arteries to cease, it appears that the total cholesterol needs to be lowered to the 150 area. Your total, everyone should know their cholesterol and should be under, under 150. In other words, you need a total cholesterol lower to that of, it just so happens to be, that of the average 
pure vegetarian or vegan. Of course, he goes on to say, because relatively few people are willing to abide by the vegetarian lifestyle, well, we've got to put everybody on drugs. All right. <laughs> so, but it's our choice, right? That's what he's saying. It's our choice, diet or drugs. Why not choose the drugs? <laughs> Seriously, right? Well, the FDA just released, um, just announced newly mandated safety labeling for cholesterol-lowering drugs. And these are the statin drugs like Lipitor and Zocor, Crestor, Vitorin, um, Mimevacor, etc. The FDA issued new um, uh, side effect warnings regarding the increased risk of brain-related side effects such as memory loss and confusion. Also an increased risk in blood sugar levels and new onset diabetes. As one prominent cardiologist kind of described this Faustian bargain, yes, fewer heart attacks, but more diabetes. Right? And as we learned actually just a few uh, weeks ago now, the adverse, uh, adverse, effects, uh, the adverse effects of statins on energy and fatigue, uh, particularly for women even at moderate doses. Right? With all this memory loss and confusion pe um, caused by these drugs, people may have forgotten there's actually a way we can lower the risk of heart disease and diabetes at the same time. It's called a plant-based diet. Now look, cholesterol is just half of the story. Um, the other half is inflammation. We've known for 15 years now that a single meal high in animal fat uh, sausage and egg McMuffins were actually used in the original study, uh, can paralyze our arteries, cutting our arteries' ability to rela relax in half within a, just a few hours of consumption. Right? The lining of our entire vascular tree gets stiffened and inflamed. And just as this inflammatory, so this is hour one, two, three, four, five, six after eating, and just after four, uh, about five or six hours, when the inflammation starts to die down, Lunch time! Right? And we may whack our arteries with another load of meat, eggs, or dairy, such that many people are stuck in this chronic, low grade danger zone of inflammation and may be increasing their risk of inflammatory diseases like heart disease, cancer, and diabetes one meal at a time. Does the same thing to our lungs again within hours. Right? Inflammation in our airways, a single meal causing internal damage, not just years down the road, but literally right then and there, that day, within hours of it going into one's mouth. And just this year, we finally uh, uncovered, kind of the, the solved the mystery as to why. I mean, we, this is, again, 15 years we've known this, replicated over and over by different labs, but why? Um, and uh, it appears not to be the animal fat itself, and actually does not appear to be the animal protein either, which is what we think is triggering uh, many uh, cases of inflammatory arthritis. But wait a second, if it's not the animal fat, not the animal protein, what is it? Well, the whole thing is, uh, is just a fascinating detective story, and I have a whole series of videos on it if you're interested in this, how they teased out uh, the, the, this whole, but let me just cut to the chase, spoiler alert here, <clears throat> that um, it turns out that after a meal of animal products, people suffer from something called endotoxemia. Their bloodstreams become awash with bacterial toxins called endotoxins that are present in the animal products. Right? Um, and uh, so, you know, no wonder our body goes crazy. We've, kind of, we've become acutely sensitive to bacterial toxins. These are toxins actually found parts of the bacterial cell walls. And these dead meat bacteria toxins aren't destroyed by stomach acid. They're not destroyed, oh, so this is, uh, they did some studies to find out what has the most. Um, and for some reason, white meat seems to have higher bacterial counts. Um, not destroyed by stomach acid, not destroyed by proteolytic enzymes of our digestive tract, um, and in fact, not destroyed by cooking. You can boil meat for hours and still not get rid of these toxins. So again, the bacteria are dead. So, you know, you're not going to get salmonella, E. coli, campylobacter, of course. This is assuming that you somehow levitated it into the oven and didn't touch anything in the kitchen. But um, so we're not talking foodborne illness. 
These are bacteria that have been cooked dead, but still the toxins aren't destroyed, and that what's causes this burst of inflammation. And then, actually the animal fat does play a profound role here. What it does is it ferries the, um, the, the bacterial toxins through the intestinal wall into our system. So the reason the animal products appear to trigger um, inflammation um, is because they're so loaded with these, um, these bacteria that can trigger inflammation dead or alive. Um, uh, even when they're fully cooked, and then saturated fat then facilitates um, the transport of toxins from our intestinal tract through into our bloodstream. Okay, so now that we know what's going on, what do we need to do? Well, from uh, the latest of this 2012 follow-up, says, well, the most obvious solution to this metabolic uh, endotoxemia, you know, would be to uh, reduce saturated fat intake. But they say the Western diet, eh, just not conducive to this mode of action. And it's difficult for patients to uh, comply with this request. So what? Don't even tell them? Right? I mean, this is this is a very kind of common patronizing attitude of the medical profession saying, ah, oh, people aren't going to change, they're not going to eat healthy, they're not going to stop smoking, even if it saves their lives, so why even mention it? Right? And I think it's that patronizing attitude um, is actually maybe one of the true leading causes of death. <laughs> But let's get back to the official list and take on cancer next. What's the latest? Well, we know from the longest, uh, the largest, excuse me, forward-looking study on dying cancer ever done that the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among vegetarians compared to meat eaters. And interesting, especially um, for the fastest growing tumors, these so-called liquid cancers like lymphoma and leukemia, and the worst meat was actually chicken, um, which was surprising to the researchers. And we're talking up to triple the rate. So these are the, um, um, uh, the risk ratios. Up to triple the rates for just every 50 grams of daily poultry consumption. You know, a chicken breast is like 200. So this is just like a quarter of a chicken breast worth of uh, poultry a day may triple our risk for these kind of cancers. Now the link between meat and cancer such that even the journal Meat Science asked the question, should we become vegetarians? <laughs> or, you knew there was going to be an or, can we make meat safer? And so there's actually this bunch of additives that they're experimenting with that can suppress the toxic effects of heme iron, the blood-based iron uh, found in animal products, for example. Now these additives are still under study but could provide what they call an acceptable way to prevent cancer because obviously reducing meat consumption out of the question. They fear that if the National Cancer Institute recommendations to reduce meat consumption were adhered to, sure, cancer incidence may be reduced, but farmers in the meat industry would suffer important economical problems. Now for those of us more worried about the suffering caused by the meat industry rather than the suffering of the meat industry, what would happen if you put cancer on a vegan diet? The Pritikin Research Foundation just completed this elegant series of experiments and actually that's what this, this two week series of uh, videos actually going up this week and last week. Um, so this is actually, if you want to follow the story more closely, I'll just be able to touch on it. Um, just If you go to the website literally today, you can see over the last week, this, this is the series of studies I'm talking about, which is really, I think, the most exciting thing happening all year in the field of nutrition. Simple experiments. You put people on different diets, you draw their blood, and then you drip their blood on cancer cells growing in a petri dish, and you just see whose blood is better at suppressing cancer growth. So they're the ones who published this study showing that the blood of those on a vegan diet was dramatically less hospitable to cancer. Now even the blood of those on a standard American diet fights cancer. If it didn't, everybody would be dead, right? I mean, it does, helps a little bit. It's just that those, uh, the blood of those eating vegan 
fights about eight times better. The blood of those on a standard American diet drops cancer growth rates by about 9%. But you put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood just tears it up. The blood circulating within the bodies of vegans has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to cancer cell growth. Now, this is done with prostate cancer, the most common cancer among men. For women, it's breast cancer. So. The Pritikin researchers decided to repeat this study, but with women and breast cancer cells instead. But look, they didn't want to wait a whole year, right? Women are dying today. So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different types of human breast cancer. So this is the before, cancer powering away at 100% growth. And this is after eating a plant-based diet for just 14 days. Here's the before picture. A layer of breast cancer um, cells is laid down in a petri dish, and then you drip blood from, people eat, from women eating conventional diets. And as you can see, their um, blood broke up the cancer, right? This is a solid carpet. Now it's just kind of continents of cancer, all right? Now, then you take these same women. This is the before after. You take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, two weeks, and they're the same women, their blood does this to breast cancer. Their body's cleaned up. Now, slowing down the growth of cancer is nice, but getting rid of cancer cells completely is even better. This is what's called tunnel imaging. This is uh, measuring DNA fragmentation, cancer cell death. Um, when the cancer cells die, they release these little, they come, they, in this kind of imaging, they come up as little white spots. As you can see, all right, there's, we got a cancer cell dying here. Even before they started eating healthy, two weeks on a plant-based diet, and you can see what happens. All right. um, this is called programmed cell death. Um, after eating healthy, their bodies were able to reprogram the cancer cells to, um, to forcing them into kind of early retirement. It's like they're entire different people inside. Right? The same blood, so this is measuring cancer cell death in three different types of breast cancer. The same blood, now coursing through these women's bodies, gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth thanks to just two weeks of eating a plant-based diet. What kind of blood do we want in our bodies? Do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our bodies with the power to slow down and stop it? Now this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses was after 14 days of a plant-based diet and exercise. Right? They were out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. Right? Well, wait a second, maybe the only reason their blood became so effective at fighting cancer was because of the exercise. Maybe, maybe the diet had nothing to do with it. So they put it to the test. This is um, measuring cancer cell clearance. Uh, this is what we saw before. So this is the diet and exercise. Plant-based diet, you can see the little apple here. Plant-based diet and just moderate exercise. You know, walking a half an hour to an hour a day. Um, cancer cell death, big spike. We already saw that. All right, now compare that to the cancer cell stopping power of your average sedentary meat eater, rocking chair with a burger, there it is, um, <laughs> which is practically non-existent. All right. Okay, but this is the interesting group in the middle. All right. This is uh, um, uh, this was this middle group. Um, so this group over here was on a plant-based diet for 14 years, along with exercise. But this group in the middle was uh, on a standard American diet, but 14 years of daily strenuous exercise, like calisthenics, um, uh, and so burger with push-ups. Um, <laughs> for those who can't see. Um, and so, look, if you exercise hard enough, strong enough, long enough, can you beat out some strolling vegans? Let's find out. 
And the exercise helped, no question. No question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym was no match for a plant-based diet. Here's an actual photomicrograph. Here we go, cancer. This is the same uh, tunnel lighting with uh, cancer cells release light when they die. Okay. Even if you're a couch potato eating fried potatoes, you're not complete, your body's not completely defenseless. But then, here's the exercise group. Uh, cancer cells dying left and right, but nothing kicks more cancer butt than the blood of those on a vegan diet. Why, though? Some people don't care. All right. Well, but I'm always curious. I mean, well, I mean, how is it that this simple dietary change, right, uh, makes one bloodstream so inhospitable to cancer in literally just a matter of days? Well, we didn't know until last year. When the researchers sought to under the, uh, determine the underlying mechanism for these anti-cancer effects. And it is a wild story, as you've been seeing over these last two weeks, which involves little people and big people and big dogs and little dogs and involves marshmallows, tinker toys, cannibalism and vegan bodybuilders. Yes, everything from beef steak to beef cake. It's a fascinating. I encourage you to check it out. And again, literally, it's, it's th this, this, this is the final week of videos, when I, then I move on to another topic. Um, Alright, okay, cut to the chase. The answer to the Pritikin puzzle is IGF-1. Insulin-like growth factor 1 is a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in every stage of cancer cell growth and proliferation, metastases, invasion. But you put people on a plant-based diet and their IGF-1 levels go down. If you keep them on a plant-based diet, then they go down, those levels go down even farther. And their IGF-1 binding protein goes up. That's one of our ways our body protects itself from cancer, from excessive growth, by releasing a binding protein into the bloodstream to, to uh, kind of bind up, to tie up IGF-1. It's like our body's kind of emergency break. Yes, in as little as 11 days, a plant-based diet can reprogram your liver to decrease the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, release of IGF-1 circulating in your bloodstream. But look, you still have all that IGF-1 in your body from the bacon and eggs you ate the week before, and so your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up excess IGF-1 um, so you don't get cancer. And as you can see, um, after a few weeks it gets good and long term it gets better. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain of the story. Okay, same as last time. Go on a plant-based diet and your cancer cell gro growth rates go down. Your cancer cell death rates shoot right up. Here's the interesting column. Okay, what they did is they took the plant-based diet blood and they added back to the petri dish the amount of IGF-1 banished from their bodies because they were eating healthy for a few days. Right? You, you start eating vegan, your IGF-1 levels go down. Let's take just that IGF-1, just the amount that dropped down. Let's add that back to the cancer, see what happens. And as you can see, it's as if you never started eating healthy at all. It erases the diet and exercise effect. So, now we know, right, that lowering animal product consumption can bring down IGF-1 levels, um, which then tends to lower cancer growth. But how low does animal product consumption have to go? How plant-based do we have to eat? Well, let's look at the IGF-1 levels of meat eaters compared to vegetarians compared to vegans. Does a plant-based diet work better at lowering circulating levels of IGF-1 uh, compared to those eating meat or those on lacto-ovo vegetarian diets. All right? This is what they found. Only the vegans had significantly lower levels. Here's the meat eaters, vegetarians. Only the vegans had significantly lower levels. And the same relationship was found with IGF-1 binding protein levels. Only the vegans had significantly, um, were significantly more able to bind up excess IGF-1 in their bloodstreams. And uh, now this was a study done on women. Uh, what about... Uh, 
What about vegan men? All right, well, they found the same thing. So uh, even though actually vegan men tend on average actually have higher levels of testosterone. I don't know why that surprises people. But uh, vegans actually have higher levels of testosterone and that can actually be a risk factor for prostate cancer. But the reason that vegan men have such low rate, in fact, in fact uh, even Ornish showed that you can actually reverse the progression of cancer by putting men on a vegan diet suggests that um, uh, you know, it's due to how low their IGF-1 levels go down. So high testosterone but less cancer. And this is the only circumstance where you see that. The bottom line is that male or female just eating vegetarian didn't seem to cut it, right? Didn't seem to do our body much favors, right? It looks like to significantly drop the levels of this cancer promoting growth hormone, um, one really has to move towards eliminating animal products altogether. The good news is that, look, given what we know about IGF-1, um, uh, you know, we may predict that a low-fat vegan diet uh, may be profoundly protective with the risk of, for example, um, breast cancer in older women. Okay, just uh, 13 causes of death to go. To go. Uh, how are we doing here? All right. All right, let me quickly run through the list. The top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Oh, that's so 2011. <laughs> now, it's cancer, stroke, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like emphysema. All right. Thankfully, COPD can be prevented with a plant-based diet, even treated with plants. If you want to check that out, it's fascinating research. In fact, for the first time, showed that you can actually improve breathing function. We thought people with COPD get worse, 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 die. But now, we we're actually able to improve breathing capacity by literally just doing some simple things like adding fruits and vegetables, um, uh, more fruits and vegetables to their diet. So um, please check that out. Um, uh, of course, the, you know, the tobacco industry, uh, you know, viewed these landmark findings a little differently. Instead of adding plants to one's diet to uh, prevent emphysema, wouldn't it be simpler to just add them to cigarettes? <laughs> and indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Next, they're going to start putting berries in meat. I couldn't make this stuff up. Here it is. Now, burger patties with, aver with added fruit extracts was not without its glitches. For example, the, the blackberries literally kind of dyed the burger patties with this kind of purplish color, which kind of turned folks off a little bit. Though, they found that infusing lamb carcasses with kiwi fruit juice before rigor mortis sets in evidently um, leads to improved tenderness. Um, and it is possible to improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds to the frankfurters. Though there were complaints that the grape seed particles became visible in the final product. And if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what goes in their food, right? <laughs> Anus, okay, but grape seeds. <laughs> Preventing strokes. Number four is all about eating potash, potassium rich foods from potassium from the words potash. Take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, pour in some water, skim off the ash. You're left with a white residue at the bottom, which is potashy yum, potassium. That's how they got its name. I only say that, mention that, because that's where, it's an illustration of where potassium is found. It's found in plant foods. Who can tell me a plant food particularly rich in potassium? <laughs> Why is that like the only thing? <laughs> Everybody knows about nutrition. I think, like Chiquita had this great PR firm or something, I'm not sure. I, in fact, I bet you could walk into the heart attack grill where they're, they're eating stuff like this and they'd be like, I don't know what to eat, but I know bananas got potassium. <laughs> right? In reality, 
Bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of potassium. Um, in fact, potassium, so bananas come in at number 86, right below fast food vanilla milkshakes. <laughs> it goes fast food vanilla milkshakes and then bananas. All right. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, and the uh, top five sources are both tomato and orange concentrates, but then in terms of whole foods, beet greens, beans, and dates. So greens, beans, and dates. But, and look, in fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas <laughs> could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, now our sixth leading killer. We've known for 20 years now that those who eat meat, red meat or white meat, appear to be between two to three times more likely um, to get uh, demented compared to vegetarians, and the longer you're vegetarian, the lower your risk of dementia. But really, the most of the kind of the new exciting research is uh, on treating Alzheimer's using these natural plant remedies, in this case, um, the spice saffron which beat out placebo and worked as good as the leading Alzheimer's drug. Again, on the website, um, if you're interested. So saffron is a spice from the saffron crocus, flower power at its best. Very expensive. Very expensive, that's true. But you just need it. They use 30 milligrams, 30 thousandths of a paperclip weight versus the, of the spice a day. Anyway, okay. Next on the kick the bucket list, Diabetes, which can be prevented, treated, and in fact, I don't know if Brenda's going to talk about even reversing um, a diabetes um, with, uh, with a plant-based diet um, uh, in many cases. Um, this, is, uh, this is from last October. Those eating vegetarian, significantly lower risk of diabetes. Vegans did the best, so this is non-vegetarians. Um, uh, cut out everything but fish gets a little lower. Um, cut out all meat gets a little lower, but cut out um, uh, dairy and eggs. And uh, one gets just kind of a small fraction of the risk. And this is interesting. This was after controlling for obesity, right? You say, oh, sure, vegans have low diabetes risk. They're so slim on average. No, this was at, so even at the same weight, um, vegans have just a fraction of the diabetes risk. Why are vegans on average so slim? You know, obesity is so rare among those eating plant-based diets that nutrition researchers have been really kind of desperate to discover their secrets. Sure, they eat fewer uh, calories, right? But uh, not that many fewer. Um, uh, so look, maybe it's though because those eating plant-strong diets have more of this fat-shoveling enzyme in the power plants or mitochondria in their cells. Um, what uh, Dr. Barnard talks about is this kind of, this kind of metabolic boost one gets eating plants. Um, uh, maybe it's because uh, we grow different populations of good bacteria in our gut. Maybe it's because we're avoiding the obesogenic endocrine disrupting chemicals in the meat supply and obesity causing virus and poultry may even be contributing. We don't know for sure, but theories keep coming. Um, here's the latest. Maybe it's the propionate. Okay. After all, what's one of the only things that's found in plant foods, not never animal foods, and that is fiber, right? Animals have bones to hold them up. Plants have fiber to hold them up. Um, I, wait a second. I thought fiber, though, was defined as our inability to digest it. Well, sure, we can't break down fiber, but the gazillions of good bacteria in our guts can. Um, and um, so technically, we can digest fiber, but just not without a little help from our little friends. What does, um, what do they do with this? Uh, what do they do with uh, fiber? They make propionate, all right, which gets absorbed into our bloodstream. What does propionate do? Well, it inhibits cholesterol synthesis. Um, oh, so this is creating propionate, inhibits uh, cholesterol synthesis, which is a nice thing. It also has what's called a hypophagic effect, meaning it decreases one's appetite because it slows the rate of um, uh, gastric emptying, the, the, the rate at which food empties your stomach so you feel fuller, longer. Um, so propionate may uh, either regulate food or actually um, uh, kind of prevent the generation of new fat cells in the first place, uh, but overall appears to have this anti-obesity effect. And we can actually boost the number of good bacteria in our guts without probiotics 
just by eating vegetarian because we're feeding our little friends with fiber. Animal foods also tend to be more calorically dense. For example, to walk off the calories found in a single pat of butter, one would have to add an extra 700 yards to one's evening walk. A quarter mile jog for every uh, sardine one wants to put in their mouth, um, and that's just the kind of edible part. Um, and anyone who wants to uh, chooses to eat two chicken legs better get on their own two legs and, uh, and go run an extra three miles that day to counter the weight gain. Um, and that's for steamed chicken um, skin removed. Here's the latest. Meat consumption and prospective weight gain. Hundreds of thousands of men and women followed for years. Um, and so this is important because, look, cross-sectionally, yeah, sure, vegans are slimmer, but maybe they were slim first and were like, oh, I feel so good, I want to eat healthy, right? You can't prove cause and effect until you actually follow people over time and see what happens. They measure people's diets, they measure people's weight, and this is what they found. Um, uh, conclusion. So uh, total meat consumption was positively in, uh, was associated with weight gain um, and uh, suggests that decrease in meat consumption obviously improve weight management. And this was after controlling for initial weight and uh, um, physical activity level and education, smoking stats. But here's the kicker. They controlled for total energy intake. So they controlled for calories. So that, that means if you have two people eating the exact same number of calories, the person eating more meat will gain more weight. They even calculated how much more. So for every 250 grams a day, like you add a steak to your daily diet, um, that would lead to an annual weight gain 422 grams higher than the weight gain experienced with the same number of calories, but if you were eating lower, uh, less meat. And after five years, look, that could, you can start put on a couple pounds, right? Um, and steak was nothing. Actually, the strongest relationship was found with poultry consumption. So let's say you're a normal weight, you eat a hamburger every day. Um, this is how much extra weight you put on every year in addition to the calories in that burger. If you were doing processed meat like a ham sandwich, this is where you'd be. And just a half of a chicken breast a day puts you up to here, again, above and beyond the calories that's actually in the chicken. In conclusion, our results indicate uh, meat, is, um, meat is associated with weight gain, and this was after adjustment for total energy, uh, caloric intake, and so therefore, obviously, in favor of this public health recommendation to decrease meat consumption for health improvement. Um, and I, the, this is actually in a series of a few videos. I, then I talk about what did the National Cattlemen's Beef Association have to say about this study, because it's one of the largest ever done. It's it's kind of a funny video, they get kind of smacked down by the researchers. Um, and I also talk about PCRM's really landmark work in a corporate setting um, here at Geico, um, putting people on a vegan diet. And, they, and uh, if you're interested in what you can do at your workplace to improve people's health and decrease um, healthcare costs, I would encourage you to check out this video. Kidney failure is our eighth leading cause of death can be prevented with a plant-based diet, can even be treated with a plant-based diet. Why? Because look, our kidneys are highly vascular organs, right? That's why they look so red inside. Our two little kidneys filter out through our entire bloodstream. And if the, uh, and look, if the standard American diet is so toxic to blood vessels in our heart, brain and pelvis causing heart attacks, strokes, and sexual dysfunction, what might it be doing to our poor kidneys? Well, long story short, Harvard researchers found three significant risk factors for declining kidney function. They were measuring protein in the urine. You're not supposed to be peeing out protein. Your kidneys are supposed to hold on to that. If you do start peeing out protein, that could be a sign that your kidneys are failing. They found three risk factors. What were they? Risk factor number one, animal protein. Risk factor number two, animal fat, and then cholesterol, all of which only found, obviously, in animal foods, right? No association was found for plant protein or plant fat. It's not the protein, it's not the fat, but it's the animal protein, the animal fat. Not only do vegans appear to have better average kidney function overall, 
but uh, um, uh, significant improvements were found treating um, uh, kidney failure patients by putting them on a pure vegetarian diet. After just one week, you could see the improvements. Leading killer number nine is people dying from respiratory infections. Right? You say, wait a second, what could uh, uh, influenza and pneumonia have to do with one's diet? Well, you obviously haven't seen my video, Kale and the Immune System. Is there anything Kale cannot do? <laughs> um, and, so, uh, and so that was on the immunostimulatory effects of Kale. In this study on boosting immunity through diet, we are now in kind of flu shot season. If during the week of getting your flu shot, you eat a few extra servings of fruits and vegetables a day, you can get a significantly greater antibody response, a greater immune response. This was to pneumococcal pneumonia. Um, and again, this was not even putting people on a plant-based diet, just adding a few servings of fruits and vegetables to their, uh, to their diet dramatically improved their immune response. Suicide is number 10. Um, and in uh, last year's talk, um, I talked about improving mood through diet. Look, we've known that vegetarian diets were associated with healthier mood states. But again, this is cross-sectional, right? Maybe people who are happy and well adjusted, you know, have time to, hey, I'm going to explore dieting and, go and, and start eating healthy and not the other way around. What you need is the gold standard in nutritional science and that's an interventional study and that's what we finally had this year. You take people eating a conventional diets, you remove meat, you remove poultry, you remove fish, remove eggs as well in this study. Um, and see what, uh, and they saw significant improvements in mood scores after just two weeks. Uh, drugs like Prozac uh, could take a month to take an effect, and after just two weeks, they saw a significant improvement. In fact, the, the way drugs like Prozac work is by boosting this, the levels of serotonin, the so-called happiness hormone in the brain. Well, did you know there was serotonin in plants? I certainly didn't. But there's serotonin and melatonin and uh, dopamine, all sorts of human neurotransmitters in plants, so much so there's been a call to start treating depression with high-content sources of serotonin. You know, like plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomatoes. All right? And look, what's the side effects? Maybe get a little strawberry seed stuck in your teeth or something? A little embarrassing? <laughs> Maybe that's why high intake of fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, soy associated with decreased risk of depressive symptoms. Maybe that's why we saw so much improved behavior in teenagers um, significantly associated with higher intakes of green leafy vegetables and fresh fruit. Um, and for more, I have this uh, video series on the wrong way to boost serotonin, which is using these tryptophan supplements, which can be dangerous, and a better way of treating things like uh, premenstrual depression, and then really the best way, um, and that is eating these specific foods um, with uh, high levels of a, of a serotonin uh, tryptophan precursor, like in this double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study of butternut squash seeds for the treatment of a social anxiety disorder, for example. <laughs> How might a plant-based diet prevent systemic infections? All right. Well, meat-borne bacteria can directly invade the bloodstream through the intestinal wall. Um, uh, but, uh, but another way is for, in women, for these bacteria to creep up into their bladder. Um, uh, just this summer, um, we had genetic fingerprinting proof of this direct link. Um, that uh, women eating uh, meat contaminated with fecal bacteria um, and then colonized the digestive tract and kind of crept up into their bladder uh, causing millions of UTIs um, in North America. And actually chicken is uh, considered the most uh, common source of infection. Wait a second, you can't sell unsafe cars, you can't sell unsafe toys, how is it even legal to sell unsafe meat. Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. As one USDA poultry virologist wrote, raw meats are not idiot proof, <laughs> right? They can be mishandled, and when they are, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's gonna get hurt. 
Now, of course, some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets. But look, if we get sick, it's our fault. That was kind of the point he was trying to make. Um, I think the conclusion, uh, the consumer has the most responsibility, but just refuses to accept it. That's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. A director of the Centers for Disease Control famously responded to this kind of blame the victim attitude coming out of the meat industry. Is it reasonable, she asked, that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, though, the meat industry's on it. They just got FDA approval for this bacteria-eating um, virus to spray on the meat. Now, this has raised concerns about the so-called bacteriophages because of the possibility the virus is uh, spreading toxin genes between a bacteria, especially given the difficulties in preventing large numbers of these viruses from being released into the environment from the slaughterhouses. Um, and look, it could also help the meat industry become even more complacent about uh, you know, food safety. They know they can just kind of spray some viruses on at the end, um, which is uh, similar to the quick fix argument about irradiation. You know, from the industry point of view, I mean, who cares if there's fecal matter in the meat as long as you can blast it with enough radiation at the end to effectively kind of sterilize it. Right? Now, the meat industry is concerned that the, the, the consumer acceptance of these bacteria-eating viruses may present somewhat of a challenge, particularly in the hippie California. <laughs> um, and so, look, if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly pupae on pork preservation, a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. It's a low cost and simple method. Look, think about it. <laughs> Look, maggots thrive on rotting meat, yet there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. <laughs> right? Not that anyone's checked. But, look, you know, look. But they, so look, they eat rotting meat. They must be just filled with some kind of antibacterial something, right? And so, hey, they took some maggots, uh, three days old, washed them off, toweled them off, uh, put them in a tissue blender, a little Vitamix action, and voila! <laughs> Safer meats. That's what we like to see. All right, we did kidney failure, liver failure is next. We've known for 35 years, since 1977, that a vegetable protein diet could be used to treat liver failure. Right? Um, uh, significantly reducing the toxins that would otherwise build up, build up eating meat without a fully functioning liver. I mean, imagine eating meat without having, you know, a fully functioning liver to detoxify your blood. Now, I do have to admit, though, that there are some people eating plant-based diets with worsening liver function. In fact, strictly plant-based diets. They're called alcoholics. Now, look, but living off barley and corn and rye and all these grapes, but still not doing so good. It's not clear. It's hmm. High blood pressure is next. So-called essential hypertension essentially only found in those eating meat. Again, look at this. We've known for centuries. This is 74 out of Hopkins. Um, that uh, consumption of food of animal origin highly significantly associated with blood pressure even after controlling for weight. Um, fast forward 39 years to 2012 uh, compared to non-vegetarians um, if uh, you become a so-called flexitarian eat meat more on kind of a weekly basis than a daily basis then you uh, drop your risk by about 23% of, uh, of uh, hypertension. Uh, uh, if you just eat fish, you're down about um, 38%. Um, cut out all meat, down 55%. You just cut your risk in half 
Um, but if you really want just a tiny fraction of the risk, one has to um, apparently eliminate all animal products. And look, same thing here with diabetes. Look, the stepwise progression as one gets more and more plant-based and looking at obesity too, anything over 25 is overweight. As you can see, the only group, it drops, 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 the only group that's on average not overweight was the vegans. And look, diabetes, hypertension, these are leading killers. How many more decades is it going to take for doctors to actually start doing something about it? How long does it take being vegan to bring down one's blood pressure? Twelve days. McDougall took 500 meat eaters, put them on a vegan diet, and over a span of just 11 days actually dropped their blood pressures around 6%, twice as much for those that were hypertensive when they came in. Fourth leading killer, Parkinson's disease. Does a vegan diet reduce the risk for Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that every single um, forward-looking study, so-called prospective study ever done, um, oh, sorry, let me go back, um, on dairy products or milk found increased risk associated with, uh, for Parkinson's associated with increased milk consumption, and the question is why? Well, one possibility, um, is that dairy products in the United States are contaminated with these neurotoxic chemicals. We have lots of evidence suggesting that exposure to pesticides may increase Parkinson's and autopsy studies have found higher levels of these pollutants and, and pesticides in the brains of Parkinson's disease patients um, and some of those compounds are present in low levels in dairy products. They're talking about toxins like uh, tetrahydroisoquinoline, this Parkinsonism related compound found especially in cheese. Now, although the amounts of this neurotoxin, even in cheese, are not very high, uh, the concern is that they may accumulate in the brain over long periods of consumption. And finally, number 15, uh, death from aspiration pneumonia, which is a problem with swallowing, usually associated with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or stroke, which we've already covered. Okay, so where does this leave us? These are the top 15 killers in the United States and plant-based diets can prevent nearly all of them, can treat more than half of them, and may even reverse the progression of disease um, in many of them, including our top three killers. Now look, there are drugs that can help too, right? You can take one drug for your know, cholesterol, maybe a couple bloods for your high blood a couple pills for high blood pressure, you know, a sugar pill for diabetes, right? But what's so neat about the diet is the same diet works against them all. It's not like, oh, there's one diet for heart disease and a different diet to prevent cancer. The same diet. The same diet, one diet to rule them all. All right. And what about drug side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash here or something. Prescription drugs kill. More than 106,000 Americans every year. This is not medication errors. This is not overdoses. This is not illicit drugs. This is drugs prescribed and filled as prescribed deaths from so-called ADRs, adverse drug reactions to prescription drugs. Wait a second, 100,000 deaths a year? Wait a second, 100,000 deaths a year? Wait a second, that means that the sixth leading cause of death in the United States is doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading cause of death is me. <laughs> Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> Seriously, though, this is a study, the longest-running study on vegetarians in human history, looking at 15,000 vegetarians in North America. And compared to vegetarians, meat eaters have twice the odds of being on aspirin, twice the odds of being on sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, insulin. So if you don't like paying for drugs, if you don't like taking drugs, if you don't like risking drug side effects, then this is the kind of diet for you. Right. Um, um, 
Now the study did show, however, that plant-based diets do have their own side effects. Side effects include less chronic disease, fewer allergies, less surgeries, less medications, and less use of health services like less hospitalizations. Um, uh, vegetarians have lower rates of everything from varicose veins to you know, hemorrhoids, even fewer hysterectomies. Can you see? Even fewer um, uh, hysterectomies. And uh, look, it's not just protection from the big killers like coronary artery disease, um, strokes, um, diabetes, uh, diabetes etc. But less diverticulosis, for example, and kind of on down the risk. Fewer diseases overall. That's what you get. That's the side effect. right? Less disease overall. Here's the allergies thing, which I just found so interesting. According again to the longest running study on vegetarians, compared to vegetarians, women who eat meat um, have uh, appeared to have 30 percent greater chance of reporting chemical allergies, 24 percent more asthma, uh, more drug allergies, even more bee sting allergies, uh, 15 percent more hay fever. Um, really seems to kind of modulate one's immune system. Now the latest side effect of plant-based diets, which we just uh, unearthed, fewer cataracts. That's what we get, fewer cataracts. Leading cause of vision loss in this country compared to those eating just a single serving or more of meat a day. Um, and uh, Americans, uh, standard Americans may get like four times that. If you eat just half a serving a day, you're already dropping um, uh, one's uh, risk down 15%. Again, 21% down if you just eat fish. You cut out fish down to 30 and 40% drop in risk by cutting all animal products out. And that's in addition to my favorite side effect of plant-based diets, helping to prevent 15 out of our 16 top killers. Want to solve the health care crisis? I've got a suggestion. Right? Imagine if our nation embraced a plant-based diet. And imagine if we just significantly cut back on meat. And there's actually one country that tried. And I will close with this. After World War II, Finland joined us in packing on the meat, eggs, and dairy. And by the 1970s, uh, men in Finland had the highest rates of heart disease in the world, putting us to shame at number two. All right. Now look, they didn't want to die. So look, they, they got serious about it. Heart disease caused by high cholesterol. High cholesterol caused by saturated fat. And so look, the main focus of the, of the strategy reduced the high saturated fat um, intake in that country. Um, and so in the United States, that's basically cheese and chicken, um, the two main sources of uh, saturated fat in the country. So what did they do? Well, a berry project was launched to switch people from, uh, to switch dairy farmers to berry farming. And indeed, many farmers did switch from dairies to berries. <laughs> they pitted villages against one another in these friendly cholesterol-lowering competitions to see which town could get the lowest average cholesterol. All right, All right. so how did they do? Well, look. On a population scale, even if you drop mortality 5%, you save thousands of lives, right? Because it's across the whole country, right? Instead, remarkably great changes took um, place. We're talking an 80% drop in cardiac mortality across the entire country. And with this greatly reduced um, cardiovascular disease mortality, greatly reduced cancer mortality, um, uh, men were living seven years longer, women living six years longer. And look, this is just cutting down on animal products. Now vying for the world record in heart disease deaths, the United States of America. So why? There's some patriotism there. Woohoo! <laughs> War number one. Right. So, why doesn't our government Right? Make these same recommendations. Well, I don't have time to talk about a whole series of videos on the conflicts of interest within the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committees. Whether um, the committee members are being funded by candy bar companies or the Sugar Association or happen to be on the, the McDonald's Council on Healthy Lifestyles <laughs> or are being funded by Coca-Cola's Beverage Institute for Health and Wellness. <laughs> Uh, one committee member actually served as the official Duncan Hines brand girl and then as the official Crisco brand girl. This is who is determining U.S. Um, nutrition policy. If you read the official dietary committee um, recommendations, you'll see 
that there's no discussion at all of the scientific research on the health consequences of eating meat. If the committee actually discussed this research, it would be unable to justify its recommendation to eat meat at all. As the research would show that meat increases the risk of chronic diseases, contrary to the purpose of having dietary guidelines in the first place. <laughs> Thus, by simply ignoring the research, the committee is able to reach a conclusion that would otherwise look improper. They can't even talk about the science. Right. We know that a plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, no meat, reverse heart disease, completely prevented death from heart disease, slow the progression of cancer, and is recommended um, by major uh, cancer research groups. But again, they can't even talk about the science because how else could they justify anything but a plant-based diet? And let me end with probably the best summary of nutrition policy in the United States that I've ever seen. After all my reading, this is what encapsulated it the best. The new dietary guidelines have been released. They tell us to eat healthier. Yeah, but not so healthy as to noticeably affect any corporate profits. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. If any of you want to share what you saw today, I have it all on a DVD. Um, there are 10 bucks over at the speaker's table. You can follow me out. Um, all proceeds go to charity, of course. And of course, all my work is available free. New video every day. Please share with your friends and family, nutritionfacts.org.